Shale oil and gas development is in the process of literally transforming global markets and local economies at the same time. And when I say uh, shale oil and gas, what I'm referring to are unconventional extraction techniques. For over a century, we've been dependent on conventional extraction techniques that require us to look all over the planet for pools of oil and gas that have seeped out of the source rock or the shale. We now can go directly into that shale and extract the oil and gas that's locked up inside. And the ability to do that is uh, causing a geopolitical uh, change in the landscape. OPEC, for example, is having to come to terms that we are and will continue to be buying less oil from them. The United States now produces more oil than it imports, first time since 1995. Texas produces more oil than it has in 30 years. And a big part of that has to do with what's going on in South Texas in the Eagleford Shale. Now, a quick housekeeping tip. Eagleford is actually spelled as two words, but it's pronounced as one. So if you're going to South Texas and you want to blend in, don't say Eagle Ford, it's Eagleford. So anyway, let me show you what I'm talking about. This is Texas. Uh, night shot from space, a couple, uh, couple of hundred miles up. You can see Dallas-Fort Worth there up at the top, Houston to the right, Austin and San Antonio kind of bunched up together. And if you look closely, you can see sort of a crescent of lights underneath Austin and San Antonio. That is the Eagleford Shale. The rigs operate 24-7 and they're flaring off some gas. So like the Great Wall of China, the Eagleford Shale is literally visible from space. And this is happening in some of the counties, some of the traditionally poorest counties in Texas. Last year alone, we estimated that there was $61 billion in economic impact supporting over 116,000 full-time jobs. Every single day, the Eagleford Shale cranks out over 600,000 barrels of oil, and by sometime in 2014, that number is expected to cross the 1 million barrel a day mark. And all of this activity, economic activity, is impacting lives. Take the case of Jeff Myers, who owns the Double C Resort in Dimmit County, Texas. Uh, the Double C is actually a hunting lodge that Jeff formed in the mid to late 1990s. And for several years, he had a pretty good business, and then all of a sudden, the recession hit in 2007 and 2008. Corporations cut back, individuals stopped booking uh, hunting trips, and business got so bad that Jeff thought he was going to lose his operation. And then, without warning, the activity in the Eagleford Shale ramped up, and thousands of workers descended on the area, a lot of them needing a place to stay. And as a result, Jeff's business has been transformed from 14 cabins to nearly 300. And his situation is not at all unusual. There are scores of small businesses, individuals, landowners, all doing very well as a result of the activity at the Eagleford. But not everybody's altogether happy with the situation uh, with regard to shale, oil, and gas, and the prospect of increased sources of fossil fuels. A lot of people have issues with, foss with fossil fuels in general, and hydraulic fracturing in, in particular. Uh, and I read a fair amount of uh, academic literature on both sides of the argument about it. Although I have to say, I, I do see a fair number of pieces uh, with titles like The Truth About Fracking. Whenever I see the word truth in the context of scientific inquiry, it makes me a little nervous. Truth is one of those terms that often gets lumped together with ideology whose first cousins we typically know of as urban legend, myth, superstition. In our economic research, Whatever we think we may know about something, we try to demonstrate through the use of fact. To borrow a line from Indiana Jones, if it's truth you're interested in, Dr. Tyree's philosophy class is right down the hall. Consider this. As a nation, as a country, we consume 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy every year. The planet as a whole consumes 500 quadrillion BTUs every year. By 2030, that's expected to be 600 quadrillion BTUs. Now, that's a lot of energy. If we look at the electricity generation component of that, we find that only 12% comes from renewables. That's geothermal, hydroelectric, solar, and wind. Another 19% or so comes from nuclear power, and the remaining nearly 70% still comes from fossil fuel, and 40%, and almost 40% around that number, is, is, comes from coal. So since we appear to be stuck with fossil fuels for at least a little while longer, it seems to make sense that we ought to at least consider shifting the mix of electricity generation, for example, away from coal and toward natural gas. Natural gas burns cleaner than oil, it burns a lot cleaner than coal, and we have a lot of it. How much do we have? Well, let me submit the following for your consideration. This is a shale oil and gas map 
of the planet. And as you can see, there are shale oil and gas deposits located all over the place. Having said that, the only place production of any magnitude is occurring is here in the United States. Now, China's looking at developing shale gas, oil and gas reserves, as is uh, the Ukraine, Argentina, and Mexico. And speaking of Mexico, let's, let's take a look at that NASA night shot one more time. Uh, this time zoomed out a bit, you can see the outline of Texas and Mexico. What's interesting about this picture is that the Eagle Ford actually continues on into Mexico. It curves around by Monterey and over to the Gulf Coast. And yet, the production activity literally stops at the border at the Rio Grande. Now, why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, the United States is virtually unique among countries of the world in that private individuals may own mineral rights. But I think the real reason has more to do with the fact that the real reason the shale, oil, and gas deposits were unlocked has to do with the fact that they, the techniques were pioneered by independent small producers, not the major oil companies. They risked capital, they experimented until they figured out how to unlock the shale, oil, and gas locked inside the rock. In Mexico, there is Pemex, the state-owned monopoly oil and gas company, and as we all know, monopolies tend not to be particularly innovative nor efficient. Now, Mexico's looking at reforming their energy, energy sector, and we'll see how that goes, but sooner or later, other countries besides the U.S. are going to tap into these shale, oil, and gas reserves as well and increase global supply even further. So that's the picture from the global perspective. What does this mean for communities like those in South Texas in the Eagleford Shale? Well, clearly all this economic activity represents an opportunity. That's all it is, it's an opportunity. Did you know that there are at least 200 ghost towns in Texas? And by some accounts, a thousand or more. A lot of them, the result of boom towns gone bust. What seems clear from that is that, if nothing else, Texas doesn't need any more ghost towns. What we need are sustainable communities. And to get there, we need theories of economic development that take us beyond just job growth to include things like quality of life, environmental stewardship, development of a skilled local workforce, development of high quality infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, I'm talking about things like roads, which are under tremendous pressure in South Texas uh, because of the huge increases in truck traffic. I'm talking about water supply, wastewater treatment, hospitals and medical facilities, K-12 education, because a lot of families base their decision about where they're going to live on the quality of the local schools. Infrastructure also needs to mean things like a robust broadband network to encourage applications like distance learning, telemedicine, both of which are critical needs to rural communities. But beyond just the infrastructure, community leaders in South Texas need to be focusing on the aesthetics, creating attractive, livable communities with things like public gathering places, amphitheaters, walkways, adopting mixed-use development to help revitalize downtown areas. Because it's this combination of public amenities and infrastructure that will enable the communities, community leaders in South Texas to accomplish perhaps their most important task, and that is diversifying their economies. Texans know probably better than anyone else that energy booms need to lead to slowdowns, if not outright busts. So in order to buffer against the prospect of a slowdown, it will be important for the communities in South Texas to look at diversifying into things like higher margin agricultural products, like olives and olive oil processing, hunting, tourism, geothermal, water desalinization, particularly uh, in light of the drought and expected population increases. But if we can put these pieces together, a diversified economic base, high quality infrastructure, high quality of life, in some of the poorest counties in the state, in South Texas, in the Eagleford, then we will have gone a long way toward ensuring the prospects for real sustainability of these communities into the next century and beyond. Thank you.